If a slip skin hag body snatched a neighbor and began feasting on neighborhood kids, what would you do? When you're one crime shy of hitting the juvie lottery and no one trusts you, the last place you want to be is living next door to a malevolent creature that wears human skin like a sculpted bodysuit and hypnotizes people into forgetting their kids so she can eat them. Poor Ben made a couple mistakes before getting saddled with his washed out dad for the summer, and those mistakes will haunt him as he tries tries to convince anyone that a cryptid has moved in next door. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the blood mother in The Wretched. A babysitter arrives to the house of unappreciated toys and finds the phone off the cradle and no one responding when she says she's there. She calls her mom to let her know she's arrived at her after school job when something deeper in the house takes a loud tumble. Instead of calling out like a normal person and then telling her mom something obviously weird is going on. She tiptoes to the open basement door where the sounds are coming from. She calls out for the mom of the house, but there's no reply. So of course, she descends into the dark pit like electricity hasn't been invented yet. Turn on the lights. You're not carrying a bat hoping to ambush brain bash whatever's down there. If there is something down there, better to alert it to your presence from up here, where there's a door you can slam in its face before beating a hasty retreat. In the basement, she finds finds a picture of the family, smashed out of its frame, with the dad's eyes scratched out. So, we're leaving immediately, yes? Whatever they're into is no business of ours, and the only thing more awkward than getting killed for snooping is being forced to sit silently while a couple you barely know has a divorce fight. Something growls with its mouth full in the darkness. <laughs> The babysitter turns the corner. She sees the mom of the house tucking into her three-year-old's neck. The kid's head lolls back as the mom turns, their face contorted into a demonic bloody sneer. That is one of a kid's meal. The babysitter bolts for the stairs, only to see the dad standing dead-eyed at the top. She begs for his help right before he slams and locks the door on her, which we see has been etched with some sort of murder rune. We cut to a new town. It's the sort of place where businesses run on the honor code. Televisions are heavy enough to crush feet and small dogs, and everyone's listing their spare rooms and cabins as vacation rentals. It's a summer town, seasonally packed with a sort of miscreants and vacationers who tick off townies and shit on hotel beds because they're not home. You know, the people who ruin it for the rest of us. Then is visiting his dad Liam for the summer, sporting a souvenir he got stealing from a neighbor and jumping from a roof trying to escape. Liam gets Ben a gig working at the Lake Marina Liam manages. It puts Ben on the wrong side of the social ladder as he watches rich kids and rednecks go do all the fun stuff he clearly wishes he was doing. At least until he meets Mal, the resident manic pixie boat girl who wears knee-high crazy socks in the scorching hot summer because she's different like that. Since every place like this has a quota for lost tourists, Ben's temporary neighbor, Abby, takes her son Dylan wandering in the woods. Where they almost immediately go off the trail and get lost. Excuse me, they're on an adventure in a forest where the trees are carved in murder runes. Dylan hears his mom calling to him from deep within a rabbit hole under a dead tree. Dylan, I'm down here, baby. Mommy needs help. Come here, sweetheart. Dylan! You're going to be in so much trouble. Listen to mommy, you will. I'm sure if I were Ichabod Crane, this would seem totally normal, but I'm not. The real Abby suddenly jump scares Dylan from behind, and when he turns back, the tree has vanished. Suspicious. Somewhere between finding their way out of the woods and getting home, Abby struck a deer, which she decides to use to teach Dylan about where meat comes from. She watches a YouTube tutorial about dressing a deer and goes for it. Almost there. <laughs> I think you did it wrong. Maybe she did, but that awful looks rank. Like that buck was rotting from the inside before she mowed it down with her indestructible truck. At night, while Ben's neighbors are getting blocked by their toddler, the sickness in the deer lets itself out to play. Let that be a lesson to buy your meat at the store. Ben's woken up by the sound of weird footsteps on the roof and goes outside with a flashlight, listening as things scurry around in the dark. He investigates a broken lattice in the neighbor's porch and I know what he's gonna find, rabies. 
or that. I mean, I didn't specify normal or supernatural rabies. Let me tell you, you don't want either. Before Ben can truly appreciate the wretched horror lurking a few feet away in the dark, a floodlight blinds him. It's Abby's husband, Ty. Ben explains he thought he saw an animal, but Ty's so sleep deprived from infant duty, he just waves him away. Turns out the real infestation in this town is kids. Ben meets Dylan, trying to anger a rabid raccoon. And at work, he meets Mal's sister, Lily. Normally, I wouldn't pay any attention to this secondary plague, but it's relevant. There's something wrong with the kids, but we'll get back to that eventually. Despite Ben telling Liam that he wanted to meet his girlfriend, Ben flakes and heads off into the woods to not hook up with Mal instead. At Abby's, she's woken up by her baby crying. When it stops, she tries to fall back asleep, oblivious to the wretch playing mommy in the other room. A little later, she wakes again and notices the baby monitor camera is pivoted differently. She walks into the nursery to find the window is open and something is wrapped up, completely still in the crib. <laughs> Yes, that sound is exactly what you think it is. The moist, squelching crunch of baby bones. Ben wanders home just in time to watch something that looks like Abby walk into the pitch black forest. His father's so mad at Ben for disrespecting his girlfriend, Sarah, he doesn't listen when Ben tries to tell him what he saw. The next day, Abby's acting different. She's crunchy, quiet, and caked in dirt. Dylan notices one of the rabbits they apparently brought on vacation, or that that the rental owner left there for guests to take care of, I can't decide which is worse, is missing. He goes to tell his mom and gets an eyeful. When his shift at the marine is over, Ben accepts an awkward ride home from Sarah, during which he makes amends and they talk about her lactose intolerance. Ben walks into the house to hear something very loudly stomping around upstairs. Why call the cops when you've got a golf club and a broken arm? He finds Dylan has broken in and hidden with his rabbit in an upstairs room. Abby calls from downstairs, but Dylan begs Ben not to let her in. She looms in the doorway and asks for her son. Ben lies and says he isn't there, but she knows he is. She stares into Ben's soul like a dementor and tries to open the screen door. Ben is forced to hold it shut to keep her from entering. The standoff ends when Ty appears and Dylan feels safe enough to run to him. But back at the rental, Robo Abby eavesdrops when Dylan tries to tell his dad that she's acting strange. Looks like we've got another shapeshifter on our hands. One that's a lot more comfortable getting up close and personal than the one in the force of death. Untangling yourself from your parents seems like an insurmountable obstacle for a kid. They are the authority figures in your life. No one else has that much influence or control over you. And when they become dangerous, it's hard to know who to turn to for help. But kids have a lot more agency than we give them credit for. Calling the cops on your parents is probably too much of a jump at this point. So instead, I might consider calling an adult you do trust. A grandparent or aunt. Even a school teacher. That's step one. Dylan should call an adult he trusts and tell them he's afraid and that his parents are acting weird. And if he only trusts Ben, then he should have asked Ben to call an adult he trusts. Calling Liam and putting Ben on the phone to ask for help would probably have inspired a much more active reaction. Step two would be securing your bedroom for the night. Unfortunately, Dylan's door opens outward, so if he doesn't have a lock we can turn, we may have to settle for either sneaking out and returning to Ben or hiding in a different room we can't can lock. If we do have a door that opens inward, we can close and lock the door. Then, wedge a chair under the knob and home alone the window by scattering toys or Legos. Something that makes noise and may destabilize anyone who tries to break in. If we make it to the morning, we should ask our dad to take us to the marina, where we can get more help from Ben. As a last resort, once we know our mom is truly dangerous, we can cause a public scene and turn suspicions on our not mom in the special ways a kid can. But again, Again, this final option is a last resort. Unfortunately, Ben isn't too concerned with Dylan's discomfort. His mind is on other things, peeping on the couple as things take a turn for this but he can only see so much from outside, perched on the roof like a creeper. The next morning, Dylan's a no-show for Ben's sailing lesson. Ben rushes over to the house looking for him. Can I help you? Is Dylan home? 
He missed his lesson today. What lesson? Your son. My son? I don't, I don't have a son. Your little boy. I got no kids, kid. Well, you don't anymore. Ben finds the murder rune carved into the porch. He snaps pics of it and reverse searches it online. Good old Google's on the ball, exploding to life with an encyclopedia's worth of information about the cryptid that's taken over Abby's body. How lucky. She's called the Dark Mother, or the Slipskin Hag creature made of root, rock, and tree, who literally slips the skin of her adult victims on like a Spider-Man suit, before devouring those who are forgotten. The hag and Abby seems to have a taste for Kinder Buenos, if you get my drift. Ben listens to Wikipedia.com and draws a salt line across his bedroom door while telling Mal about Dylan's disappearance and spying on Abby. Maybe you want to go through the house and lay down salt lines across all the thresholds instead of just your room. A bit selfish. Mal suggests he go over and talk to Abby, but when she realizes Ben isn't listening, she strolls over and pokes the bear by slipping a message under the front door that says, we know what's in your cellar. Ty finds it, and Dark Mother Abby bewitches him for it. Then, she goes to the marina office and steals a photo of Mal and her sister Lily. This is why you don't bring acquaintances to your supernatural ops. At night, Ben rummages through Abby and Ty's garbage and finds old toys and photos of their kids. Let's take that with us. And in the morning, we can go find the other proof we need to take this hag down. Instead, Ben tries using winter salt to encircle the house. When that doesn't work, he breaks into Abby's cellar to investigate by himself without telling anyone what he's doing. He finds a totem shrine along with a photo of Abby, Ty, and their two kids. Yet another piece of evidence we can take with us to prove something's going on. When we call the FBI to report some missing kids. And that is exactly what we should do. We have the trash bag full of kid stuff. We have scratched out photos of the family. What we also have is access to a bunch of marina records with Dylan's name for sailing lessons. We know his first name. And with a payment stub from one of his parents for the lessons, we know his last name. That means we could walk right out of here, gather our evidence, and use social media, Google, or a good old-fashioned phone operator to locate a family member who knows that Dylan exists. Just because the slipskin hag can erase memories from the people she targets doesn't mean she can do it to people she isn't in physical contact with. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, school teachers, neighbors back home, several someones are going to remember Dylan. What we need to do is call them, tell them that Dylan is missing, and that Abby and Ty have lied about knowing where he is. Then, tell them you're calling the FBI and ask to use them as a contact. I'm guessing anyone concerned about Dylan's well-being will be super willing to help us. The point isn't necessarily to save Dylan. I mean, who really cares? The point is to get Mulder and Scully on the case, to X-File the hag's demonic... If agents come to investigate, which is well within their purview, even if those agents disappear, other agents will realize they're gone. Eventually, there'll be too many disappearances to ignore, and the hag will be forced to move on. This isn't so much a way to save ourselves or anything, but to take down the hag for good, or get her to flee the area. To his credit, Ben calls 911 immediately. I'd probably leave the basement first, considering he got that arm cast breaking and entering before. But at least he's calling. Before he could tell them which kids are missing, he sees a scratched out photo of Mal's family. Looks like the wretch is targeting Mal's sister, Lily. He calls Mal to warn her, but Mal's already forgotten Lily, just like Ty forgot Dylan. Ben reaches the playground and sees Lily walking away into the woods with Abby. He reaches the wretch's lair just in time to see Lily being yoinked inside. <laughs> Thank the Bog Witch for his plot armor. Otherwise, he dies here when the wretch crawls out of her hole and chows down on his unconscious body. Again, as cold as it is, we shouldn't go off half after a supernatural human eater. At this moment, the hag is in Abby and targeting Lily, a kid Ben's dad Liam knows and has met. The hag wouldn't have had time to erase Lily from the mind of every person in town. If it were me, I'd be racing for my dad to let him know I saw someone taking Lily into the woods. We need to recruit numbers to our side. At the very least, we're not going anywhere near that thing without knives, fire starters, and someone else who can corroborate what we see. Ben wakes after dark and stumbles home. 
guy stares at him from the far porch. Liam's inside with the cops, who aren't there because Ben was missing. They're there because Ben broke into the house next door and got into a fight at the marina. He tries to explain everything to his dad. She's making people forget about their kids. Just look in her cellar. She won't Stop even know it. who you're talking ben, about. Ben, this is done! Too bad you didn't keep even one single photo of the several you found today proving kids are going missing. Liam says they'll get Ben some professional help and leaves to talk to the cops. While he's outside, Ben talks to Sarah, noticing that she's using milk in her coffee despite being lactose intolerant. He realizes this isn't the real Sarah. The slipskin hag has crawled into her while he was gone. Dun dun dun. I mean, great job being observant, Ben, but I know a lot of lactose free people who still gorge on ice cream and just accept the intestinal consequences. So not quite the nail in the coffin you think it is. Of course, his concerns turn out to be spot on. Even though he doesn't say a word, Sarah seems to sense his change instantly. Her magic witch powers kick in, insta-wilting flowers that were alive the entire scene until this moment of realization. I like this house. And of course, Liam arrives just in time to think his son has gone insane and attacked his girlfriend. This cryptid is OP. She can whisper hypnotic curses, kill forests, turn off lights, and perfectly time things to camouflage herself as a victim when necessary. Her only weakness seems to be leaving loose threads. If you can turn people into mindless zombies, why not just zap all the teenage angst out of Ben and live your perfect child eater pod person fantasies in peace? Ben is arrested and panics when he sees Sarah whisper into the ear of the cop. He tries to warn his dad that Sarah isn't who she claims to be, begging his dad to go check out the cellar. The cop drives Ben to the beach and drags him from the car. He plunges Ben into the water to drown him. He flails as the hand holding him under lets go. A dog is materialized out of nowhere and attacked the cop, giving Ben a temporary reprieve. Whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. Apparently, the wretch's powers only stretch so far. They're no use against plot armor. Liam prepares to leave to follow his son to the police station when Sarah tries to lure him into staying home. He makes it to his car, but changes his mind at the last second. He opens the cellar and descends. When he doesn't find anything, he emerges to see Ty Zombie walking into the garage. Liam follows him in and discovers Abby's hollowed out corpse as well as Ty's hanging body. The weird totem is bright with candlelight. He finds finally sees the photo that proves Ben was telling the truth, along with one Ben didn't see. Sarah seemingly teleports behind him, wearing the deer skull, and stabs him. He scrambles away, and she follows the trail of his blood as fire spreads through the building. In a clever move, Liam uses his own blood to lure her where he wants her. Stab Liam. Stab and smash while whatever's inside her is readjusting. This cryptid is weakest when her skin suit doesn't fit properly. He's too slow. The hag lays him out and begins choking the life out of him while molting in her skin suit. <laughs> Suddenly, shots ring out. Ben fires on her with the cop's gun, but it's not enough. Okay. I'm gonna need a young priest, an old priest, and one of an anti-parasitic. Ben gets Liam into the car, but stops to watch the garage burn. He's seized by a sudden memory of the picture on the hag's altar, of him, his parents, and his younger brother. We flash back to Ben's arrival by bus to find he was traveling with his little brother Nathan. Apparently, in the few hours the hag has been in Sarah, she has entirely erased memories of Nathan from Ben's mind, altering memories scattered throughout his entire time home. Ben returns to the house to find his brother's room and the window smashed out. He gathers gear in the garage. It seems the action of the wretch emerging from a human skin removes the memory wash on everyone. Mal arrives asking where her sister is. They race into the woods to the rabbit hole tree where Ben can hear Nathan screaming for help. 
He douses the whole thing in gasoline and ties off a rope to his waist. He hands Mal salt and tells her to form a circle around the tree and if he's not back in 10 minutes, burn the whole thing down. Instead of a time limit, how about you give her a password so you can take your time saving all the kids that are still alive in there. And then when you do emerge, she can double check it's actually you. On top of that, we need fire, both in terms of additional ammo and of the flame variety. Cops in most American states carry at least one, if not two additional magazines on their utility belts. So we need to double back to that cop on the beach and get them. Actual fire is also just obvious. We need to see in the darkness under this tree, and most things are scared of fire. Ben crawls into the tree, landing in a semi-flooded area full of dead kids. Deeper in, he finds Nathan swaddled in tree roots. He sets him free, then follows the inhuman sounds of something deeper in the tree. <laughs> I mean, I get it. I get territorial around my snacks too. Like any sane person would, Ben turns around and hightails it after his brother, but he doesn't get far. He shoots her three times and the wretch drops him, but not before cutting his stomach. Let's hope this isn't a werewolf type cryptid that infects via bite or scratch. He helps Nathan out of Shrek's stump, but hears Lily's cough, forcing him back in to look for her. She's still alive, although way further ingrained into the tree roots. The hag is still angry and attacks. <laughs> He knocks her back with a stray antler and crawls out with Lily, not quite making it past the salt circle before the hag latches on. A car horn blares. It's Liam. The blood loss has him driving half out of his mind, giving Mal and Ben a second to get out of the way. Mal tosses pocket salt in the hag's face and pulls Ben aside right before Liam crushes her. That could have gone so much worse. And it's kind of lame we don't get to see the kids defeat her for real without the help of a reckless driving dad. Ben's family survives, and he finally gets the girl, only to realize... The hag transferred into Mal, somehow. Which makes total sense, of course. All the cool scenes in good movies happen off screen. If we're totally honest, Ben's dead several times over here. The hag has the literal super ability to mind wipe people. If she wanted, she could lobotomize anyone with a few cursed whispers. And she has no reason not to with someone like Ben, once she knows he's onto her. She can also change bodies relatively easily. I mean, she has to buffalo build them first but it's a great camouflage and readily available. Ben's chances are limited. He could take the evidence in the trash and the scratched out photos to the feds immediately after finding them. Maybe, maybe they believe him. Even if they do, it probably wouldn't be fast enough to save his dad, brother, or Mal's sister from being targeted. He could also just bounce, abandoning his brother, father, and friends in the process. Some people would say that's a sacrifice they're willing to make. But since Ben's not a sociopath, it never occurred to him as an option in the first place. By the time he knows she's truly a sinister supernatural presence in their lives, she's already taken over his dad's girlfriend and erased Nathan from his memory. It's a momentary setback that lets him remember his brother at all. The slip skin hag is so OP, she should probably just slip into a billionaire's skin and have sycophants serve kids to her on a silver platter and skip all the theatrics and the sticks. For those reasons, I think the wretched is unbeaten. Moral of the story, trust nobody.